Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. I'm Annie O'Gara of the Stop the JNF campaign, and this is the second of our monthly webinars. And this is how it will run today. We have three speakers, each will have about 10 to 15 minutes in turn, and I'll take their, our speakers' contributions one after the other, and there will be some time at the end for questions. It would be good if you could use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and it would also be helpful if you could identify the person that you particularly want to ask a question to. And that's especially important if you have a question for Salman Abu Sitta, one of our speakers, as he has to go on to another webinar at five o'clock. Now, obviously, the agenda has been advertised very clearly, so no one who's joined us is under any illusions about what we're talking about. So we're hoping that it will all go very smoothly. Now, this webinar builds on the one last month, and if you missed it, you can catch up with that on our website. But today, we'll be looking at the JNF from its inception in 1901 up to and through the NACBA, with each speaker taking us through different stages of that period, and with one giving us a case study of her family's experience. This will give us the essential backstory in support of our contention. And our contention is that the JNF has played a major role, both in the historic colonization of Palestine and the creation of the apartheid system of Israel. And also that it remains an agent of the state's projects as the Sumerian family facing eviction in East Jerusalem and the Bedouin of the Nakab facing ethnic cleansing will testify and we believe that given its record and its current actions it's not fit to be a registered charity. We have three speakers, Ilan Pape, Salman Abu Sitta and Khalud Alajama and their life's work has been to counteract the prevalent pro-Zionist narrative and to assert an alternative view, in each case rooted in fact rigorous research and, in my view, guided by unfailing moral compasses. Our first speaker is Ilan Pape, uh, an inspiring speaker and teacher, an eminent historian, and in his book The Idea of Israel, also a socio-cultural analyst. In a recent talk that I heard about why Palestine is still the issue, Ilan identified the massive denial of the Palestinian experience as a reason why Palestine still matters so much. No other people are so oppressed. The information about their oppression so clear and so readily available and yet so uniformly ignored. And the truth about their narrative so negated by governments, by elites and by the media as the Palestinians. And no other oppressive regime is so warmly and uncritically embraced by liberal democracies as Israel. Um, Elan, reading your book, the ethnic, cleansing, the ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, I'm struck by the number of times the JNF is mentioned, often through the person of Yosef Feitz, the head of the Land and Settlement Department. Could you speak about the role of the JNF in the colonization of Palestine from its foundation, that is the foundation of the, JN, of the JNF, up to the Nakba, um, describing how its ideology, policies and practices evolved over those early years. And also in your view, um, what influence did the JNF have on the early Zionist leaders' political directions? Yes, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. It's a, it's a great pleasure uh, to join you all uh, in this uh, uh, important uh, uh, webinar and uh, particularly honored to be with uh, Salman and Khulud uh, and uh, uh, to be part of this uh, uh, meeting, uh, one of many, uh, which wants to expose, and rightly so, uh, the organization, the JNF, that uh, uh, still appears to some people in the UK as an ecological uh, outfit, whereas in, in fact it is uh, a tool for Repla for uh, displacement, replacement, ethnic cleansing, and colonization. 
Uh, the uh, Jewish National Fund uh, uh, was is, is almost as old as the the World Zionist Congress. Already in the first uh, uh, meeting of the con Congress of the World Zionist Congress in 1897, the idea was brought up that there needs to be a vehicle for uh, recruiting money uh, in order to purchase land in Palestine to build a basis or the infrastructure for a Jewish state uh, uh, in the land of the Palestinians. Uh, officially, it was established in 1901, and immediately it began with this kind of task, recruiting money from the outside, and then trying to, to purchase the land in Palestine uh, itself. It benefited from the fact that uh, some of the large landowners in Palestine uh, towards the end of the Ottoman period uh, were uh, absentee landlords, namely people who lived outside of Palestine. And there was already a change in the uh, land regime in the Ottoman Empire that enabled uh, transactions with land. The difference between the Zionist purchase and any other purchase that preceded it was that the Zionist uh, purchase in, in, uh, purchasers in, insisted on evicting the tenants, the farmers who lived on, the, on these lands, whereas former owners, even if ownership changed, there was a respect for a custom and not just for a law that the ownership changes or the change of ownership does not mean evicting a whole villages or part of villages, uh, but rather leaving the, the, the peasant or the, or the farmer on their lands. Zionism insisted that any land it buys needs to be followed by the eviction of the people who lived sometimes for centuries on those lands. Now, the Ottomans did not allow them uh, to do it that much, but once Britain became responsible uh, after occupying Palestine in 1918, uh, Britain allowed, uh, in the name absurdly, of respecting the individual rights of a landowner uh, uh, to uh, evict, allow the Zionist uh, movement, uh, the JNF, I'm sorry, to be involved in direct evictions of Palestinian farmers from their lands. Beginning in the uh, mid 1920s, both in Marji ben Amar, which uh, is a valley in the north uh, east of Palestine, and in Wadi Hawaris, which is another uh, important area in the middle of, of Palestine. With the help of British police, uh, 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 thousands of Palestinians were the first victims of ethnic cleansing after, uh, as a result of the purchase that was uh, um, uh, facilitated by the Jewish uh, National Fund. Now, uh, after the uh, Second World War, especially, but even during the Second World War, the Jewish National Fund became a very important factor in um, influencing the overall strategy of the Zionist movement towards the eventuality of uh, the end of a British mandate and the vacuum that would be created as a result of this. Uh, uh, people like Menachem Osishkin, who was the first president of the Jewish National Fund, and uh, the person uh, you have mentioned, Yosef Weitz, were already in the 1920s and the 1930s writing, uh, wrote only in those, already at that period, wrote very explicitly and very uh, 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 clearly about the need to uh, ethnically cleanse the Palestinians for the sake of creating a Jewish state uh, in Palestine. Now, after the Second World War, they became far more important within the group of people that strategized uh, uh, or, or helped the Zionist leadership to strategize to, uh, 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 its policy and action towards the end of the uh, uh, British uh, mandate. And um, uh, uh, from that moment onwards, they succeeded in uh, establishing official outfits like a committee for transfer that uh, would be part of the Zionist action uh, on the ground the moment it was possible uh, to begin uh, occupation of villages or assaults of Palestinian villages that led to partial uh, eviction and sometimes to, to full evictions even before the British have left Palestine. And as we know, the British, uh, 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 the last British soldier left Palestine on the 15th of May, 1948. And uh, so the Jewish National Fund became a very important vehicle 
in the year and a half, I would say, on the last year and a half of the British uh, uh, mandate, when uh, it, it, it very interestingly and very uh, ruthlessly, uh, one of its main targets in those uh, 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 15 months was uh, to try and convince uh, communities, Jewish communities, Jewish settlers communities, who were part of a mixed communities, namely they were, uh, uh, they leased houses or flats or lands in some Palestinian villages, creating a kind of mixed communities. The main effort of the JNF in those years was to convince uh, the Jewish settlers to kick out the people who hosted them and actually gave them space to live and in many cases also taught them how to cultivate the land and become farmers because Jewish settlers had very little experience in how to, to work uh, the land. So that was one of the major uh, tasks of Yosef Weitz. Another task was to create this formula that would become a kind of uh, a routine whenever, uh, whenever a Palestinian village would be uh, attacked or taken over to turn it immediately into a Zionist asset. Uh, even, and, and as I say, this all happened even before the end of the British mandate. Uh, the first uh, villages occupied in this method, uh, 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 the first villages were occupied in this method already in February 1948, and, uh, and, and immediately the JNF became an integral part of the mechanism uh, that uh, was at work to turn uh, an occupied and expelled village into uh, a, a land asset for the uh, uh, future Jewish state. Later on, they would either settle their uh, uh, Jews instead of the indigenous population, or they would plant uh, a forest over the ruins of, uh, of the village or, or cultivate uh, its land uh, and give it to one of the Jewish settlements uh, around it. Um, the most important part, of course, of the Jewish National Fund as a colonization uh, agency comes within in the very uh, months of the Nakba itself, uh, when um, it is there to, that when it sort of takes over millions of Palestinian dunams uh, and uh, turn them into Jewish settlements and Jewish recreational uh, uh, fund. This was not only a, a matter of transferring land and assets from one community to the other, it was also part of an, a project of um, what I called in my book, Memrocide. The idea was to wipe out the, uh, any, any ten tenable uh, uh, um, uh, proof for the, or evidence rather, for the existence of a Palestinian village or a Palestinian uh, community. I, I should add um, that already in the 1930s, uh, in kind of a, a Zionist foresight, the Jewish National Fund suggested of creating few front organizations that uh, were doing the same job that it was doing, but uh, appeared as if they're independent organization, although they all were in one way or another, a Jewish National Fund organization. One of them was called Hachsharat HaYishuv, later Inuma. Uh, these organizations were the ones who prepared the legal infrastructure for the Jewish state to make sure that, not, that any land purchased until 1948 and any land taken by force during 1948 could only be sold and leased to Jewish citizens of the future state of Israel. Uh, and uh, this is why Uri Davis rightly says that 93% of the land within the state of Israel is uh, uh, exclusively for the, for the use of the, of the Jewish uh, community. But I would like to, sh to show that this was a long-term strategy that was already devised in the 1930s. So to sum up, because I have only 10 minutes for a history that really deserves a whole uh, a module. Um, it is a mixture of legal, late legalism, uh, brutality, uh, and uh, fabrication or propaganda of uh, about ecology 
and uh, a prosperity that together characterize uh, the, one of the most important agency in the Zionist takeover uh, of Palestine. And it's, it's quite incredible how its origins tell us much of what it would do later uh, uh, and how I can't think of any other kind of purely colonialist uh, organization that would still be intact and legitimized uh, in the 21st century. So it's legal activities, it's actual activities on the ground and it's propaganda outside in the world make it one of the most lethal tools the Zionist movement had used in order to um, perpetrate the ethnic cleansing of Palestine that should be noted did not start in 1948, but already began in earnest in the 1920s when quite a few Palestinians lost their homes as a result of the Jewish National Fund and similar bodies, purchase of land and insistence of uh, eviction. And of course, uh, its major crime is the way it uh, took over the 531 villages the army has destroyed throughout the Nakba and uh, tried to wipe it out, which is the major, was the major evidence for the uh, crime against humanity that Israel perpetrated in, in 1948. So maybe I'll stop here. We'll be very happy to take uh, questions and, and, and comments. Mm. Thank you, um, Ilan. We're going to take questions at the end, but may I just okay. ask you one question? Mm -hmm. uh, from, from the period you've just been covering, um, uh, John Hope Simpson's report as early as 1929 picked up and identified for the British mandate some of the devastating effects of the JNF's policy. I think he said that the land was being extraterritorialized and um, that it ceased to be land from which the local people, the indigenous people could benefit. And he said it's impossible to view with equanimity the extension of an enclave in Palestine from which the Arabs are excluded. So he was, he was in the British mandate. Why didn't his voice carry any weight? Well, neither his voice, not that of uh, James MacDonald in, um, uh, uh, sorry, of, of Lord Passfield, sorry, uh, Sidney Webb, uh, uh, a, a year later carried out any weight with the British uh, policy. There were two reasons for that. One is that um, the crime was already done by the time that he wrote his, uh, his report, namely, uh, thousands of Palestinians have already lost their their homes and and uh, and fields and moved to um, kind of slums around Jaffa and Haifa, uh, and uh, especially we all know about the uh, Ard al Ramel, the, the 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 kind of slum that was created uh, on the um, coast in Haifa. Later, they were moved by the British to uh, a neighborhood called Hawa Al Hawase. Uh, the, the deed was already done when he wrote it. Now, after he wrote it, one should say that, first of all, British policy became a bit more, uh, uh, became a bit more cru um, kind of critical of Zionist land purchase. Uh, of course, this would be manifested in the white paper of 1939 that tried to limit uh, uh, Zionist uh, uh, purchase of land. And secondly, the Palestinian National Movement began to be much more aware of the people who sold the land. You know, only 10% of the land that eventually the Zionist Movement purchased through the JNF up to, uh, uh, up to 1948, only 10% was sold directly from farmers to the JNF. All the rest was uh, actually land sold by uh, uh, landlords to the Zionist uh, uh, Movement. And these landlords became target, were targeted by the Palestinian National Movement after the, in, in the early 1930s, and especially during the, 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 the revolt of 1936. So in a way, even if the British policy would have, and it did change, it was too late. It was many, in many ways too late. The land purchase between 1930 to 1948 was not very impressive. There is one telling dialogue between uh, Yosef Weitz and Yosef Nachmani, who was his deputy, and David Ben-Gurion, 
1947, where he really rebukes them. He says, in the last 15 years, it comes in a, a very good documentary about the Nachmani diaries. And he says to them uh, in Tel Aviv, he says, you, in the last 15 years, you've hardly purchased any land, uh, uh, which means we will have a Jewish state on 6% of Palestine. Uh, we now will have to do something else in order to have enough space that would have a viable state. Namely, the failure to purchase land between 1930 to 1948 is one, not the only, by all means, the only, but one of the, one of the, of the, uh, of the reasons that they went to this massive ethnic cleansing uh, during 1948. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Elon. Um, our second guest is uh, Salman Abu Sita, who is himself a survivor of the Nakba and a champion of the refugee right of return, a right which he himself claims and which he argues compellingly is sacred, legal and feasible. Um, Salman's autobiography, Mapping My Return, is lyrically elegiac and stirringly political. And I have to say that the story of his friend Nadid and Nadid's mother um, has stayed with me ever since I read it. Salman's magisterial Atlas of Palestine maps every inch of historic Palestine and is a gift to anyone who cares about the land. Now, um, Salman, we could spend hours on the Nakba, but could I ask you to address three points, be beginning with a quotation, and um, this is it. JNF, through their great influence, directed the Israeli military operations for the conquest of Palestine, even before the British mandate ended and before the State of Israel was created. Um, could you explain what the role of the JNF was in that uh, military process? And also, and Elan's touched on this already, but perhaps you could take it further. The JNF claims that it legally, on its modern day website, it claims it legally bought and paid for all the land that it owns. Um, how true is that? And finally, uh, could you give your view on the impact that the JNF has had on the right of return, which is so important, and on the shape of the emerging state of Israel after the Nakba. Thank you, Annie. Thank you for inviting me. And hello, my friend, Ilan. We meet uh, quite a number of times in this difficult time of Corona and uh, May, the month of remembering uh, Nakba. And Khulud, now I see you. Um, we'll have to do something about the Atlas. We'll solve that problem. Um, thank you all for standing up for Palestine. I keep saying I am a selfish person. I fight all my life for my ha uh, house and land which is taken away from you. But you all stand for me because of your conscience. And I thank you for that. Um, the uh, JNF actually has... Uh, uh, Ilan has uh, quite eloquently explained, uh, is a tool of uh, 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 colonialism. It's a tool, actual tool, an important tool. But actually, um, it could have been taken to Nuremberg uh, trials, uh, which has taken place uh, three years uh, uh, before 1948. Um, as early as January 1948, um, the JNF, um, of course, in January, that was six months before the settlers uh, state was declared. Uh, JNF sat with the military experts and saying which land we should take first. We should land uh, take um, uh, higher priority. We need this land urgently because it's surrounded by Arabs and so on. And actually they, they worked a plan together as early as that to determine the exact location of new settlements and the priority of which area to take first and second. Why is that? Because they had developed a plan to settle even at that time um, when we we're only 400,000 Jews in Palestine to settle one and a half million of Jews in Palestine. So the natural question is to ask, how did they plan to uh, settle one and a half million? Obviously, the answer is to get rid of 
as many Palestinians as possible, and also to take their, um, their <clears throat> land. Because at that time, the um, uh, Jewish settlers have controlled only 5% uh, of Palestine. So the obvious uh, uh, principle behind that is that we are going to dispossess and expel uh, many Palestinians and cities. And they did actually. For example, um, they directed the military operations which resulted in Butaima. They gave uh, the instructions to evacuate Butaimat. And Butaimat was a land was important uh, to the GNF because it was somehow critical for them. Then they actually directed the um, occupation um, of Dalit um, um, al um, the uh, Before the British departure, um, they have a list of uh, villages to be evicted. Um, villages near Qira Khammoun. And um, not only that, but to prevent their return by raising the, um, the houses of these villages. And as um, uh, Ilan just said, to refuse the tenants to stay in the land um, in which they live. The Gawarna uh, in Haifa Bay were also a direct victim of that. As I said, um, in addition to Talit al-Ruha and Qumya. Qumya was very particularly important for them to do that. Um, uh, they also directed um, uh, in the transfer committee um, the, uh, on June 4, which is of course after the establishment of the state, destruction of the villages, prevention of cultivation of the land by the Palestinians, settlement of Jews, enacting legislation geared to barring their return, making propaganda aimed at not return, that you'll be destroyed, there is nothing there. Then. So they just, also, <clears throat> the, um, they have a direct hand in leveling of handful of villages like Al-Mughar, in Fajja, in Biar Adas, uh, in Beit Dajan, in Miska, and Sumeria, uh, and Sabarin, um, and um, the, 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 the principle behind that is that not only they will evacuate uh, or um, expel the population of these uh, uh, villages, but then they were instrumental in the process which followed, namely the demolishing of the houses in these villages. Um, the first people to do that um, after the army, of course, during the uh, um, destruction um, was the Public Works Department and the uh, Jewish National Fund. They, they were trying to bring people uh, to live in the um, depopulated uh, uh, villages. Uh, many of them they found not suitable and so they, they destroyed them. The destruction was, um, uh, was deliberate uh, and uh, continuous. Actually, it was continuous until 1967 war. So it is a, a deliberate one. Um, then your point about, um, they say they have legally um, uh, ob obtained or gained or owned land. This is not true. The, during the British time, they, were, they managed to buy through British conclusion, uh, collusion, 936,000 dunams. Um, that's almost 1 million dunams out of Pakistan's area, 27 million. But in December 1948, something unusual happened. Number one, in 10th of, January, uh, 10th of December 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights took place. The second day, 11th of December, the United Nations passed a famous resolution, which is still valid today, Resolution 194. And that resolution um, um, said that the refugees must go back. Now, Ben-Gurion was taken aback. What can he do? At the time, 
uh, Israel was not admitted to the United Nations. So he developed a ruse. He agreed with the uh, Jewish National Fund to sell them the land he occupied um, in a fictitious sale. Uh, why is that? The idea was that um, he will claim it is not in our hands. It's owned by the Jewish National Fund. And who is Jewish National Fund? It's an international organization which is found everywhere. The beneficiaries of uh, the JNF is not a settler or two as in Australia. The, set, the beneficiary is a nebulous body, imaginary body called the Jewish people around the world. So go and chase them if you want this land. It belongs to these people around the world. There is no way to reach them. So his trick was to do that, um, to avoid possible return of the refugees. And they agree that actually the amount of land was 2.2 million dunums, which is now in the hands of the kibbutz. Um, they had a sale deed, um, which is of course fictitious and illegal. Um, and there is, I have found no record of that the amount of uh, money mentioned has ever been paid. But uh, let me say uh, um, uh, something else here. Um, the, uh, the total amount uh, which they have uh, gained, uh, uh, yes, here it is. The JNF finally, and we have a map, by the way, in our website. Um, the JNF uh, in this period, after 1948, other than the British uh, time, they had taken the land of 372 Palestinian villages. And their land is 6 million dunums. And the re refugee population whose land taken over by uh, JNF of today, he, they have taken the land of 55% of all the refugees today. So if there is a claim in the world courts, ha more than half of the Palestinian refugees will claim the money stolen or taken by JNF. Therefore, your court cases in Scotland is valid in more ways than one because they actually stole the land of more than half the Palestinian refugees. And to conclude, I am one of those refugees. The JNF has taken my land, it's called Al Ma'in, 55,000 dunums, just east of Khan Yunis. So I have a claim, a person claim against um, um, the JNF. And uh, the, the right of return will be one way I and 7 million Palestinians are fighting and will never give up to recover the land stolen by JNF and um, stolen by the so-called State of Israel. We will never give up on that. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Salman. And I'm sure that a lot of what Salman said there um, was very relevant and important to our next guest, who is Haloud Alajana. Um, because Haloud was brought up in Ida refugee camp Bethlehem, but as she will tell you, her actual home is Ajur, and her family lands now lie underneath British Park, created by the JNF UK on three villages ethnically cleansed in the Nakba. Um, Haloud is a political activist, who's currently completed, she, she's just submitted her PhD dissertation in Groningen in the Netherlands. And she came to the UK over 10 years ago now, when I first met her, to the Discover Palestine Festival in Halifax, West Yorkshire, as the young spokesperson for the Laji dance group from Ida Camp. And this embroidery behind me, which is the work of many hands, um, is one of the byproducts of that festival and its sister embroidery hangs in Haloud's um, place of residence in Ida Camp. 
Um, Haloud, we've heard from Elan and Salman about the critical role of the JNF in the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. And your family, of course, is one of the thousands of Palestinians who were driven out of their home and their land in Ajur and who now live as refugees. Um, can you give us your family's story, uh, please? And also bring us up to speed about the case against the JNF UK that you and your supporters um, took to the Charity Commission in 2019. Thank you, Annie. It's a great pleasure to be sharing this platform with, um, with you together with uh, Dr. Salman and Professor Pape. Um, and I enjoyed very much hearing them speak about it, although it's, a, it's not the, the nicest topic to be talking about. Um, do you hear me all right? I, I hope so. Anyway, I'll, I'll carry on. Yeah, um, we, we can hear so you. My, yeah, good. Um, I was born in a refugee camp in the late 1980s. But my family history goes back to the village of Ajur, where my parents were born and where my grandparents were born and our ancestors as well. My grandparents were displaced uh, from the village in 1948 together with some 4,000 people who were inhabitants of Ajur. Not one day in my life that passed without my grandmother speaking about the stories of the life in Ajur. Ajur was a land that was fertile, that was hilly, and at the same time, uh, people cultivated mainly corn and olives, um, and where people lived very much in tranquility. They, um, they exchanged um, produce from other villages around them, and in 1948, they, they lost the village. However, they never, they never gave up on their right of return. So my grandmother, who's over 100 years old now, she always speaks about the village, about the life in the village, and also about her dream to return to the village. And that's um, where my dream to return came from, before I learned about the right of return and international law and so on. Um, so the, in, in relation to my village, I was able to visit only once in my lifetime. And when I visited, I was surprised to see big boards uh, stating that this place now is called the British Park or Britannia Park and the signs around it said it's um, it's established thanks to the funding of the JNF friends in the UK and that's when I realized the role of the JNF especially in the ethnic cleansing of my village but also in hundreds of uh, Palestinian villages in 1948 and the years after and although claiming that it's an ecological and environmental organization, the JNF has done so much harm to the indigenous land of Palestine. And I will give some examples from Ajur um, whilst I, I explain a bit about the, um, the case against the Charity Commission in the UK. So when, before I go into the, um, the, the case that we had uh, two years ago against the Charity Commission, I, will, um, I, I would like to mention that there was a similar case in 2013 to the Charity Commission uh, by the Stop JNF UK, which I think the campaign itself started in, um, in 2010 or a bit before. Um, and the case at the time was uh, um, like application to the Charity Commission to stop the, uh, the charitable status of the JNF UK based on the ethnic cleansing of Canada Park, uh, which, is, which, um, which stands on ethnically cleansed villages, Amoa, Yalo, and Betnuba. And at the time, uh, the Charity Commission refused the application and they said that the JNF UK is not related to the JNF Canada, which is um, a false claim anyway, because the, the JNF, although it has different, uh, different branches over than 50 states around the world, it is still the same organization and all the funding, according to their own website, all the funding goes to Israel. 
So that's also something to remember when, when we remember when the, the Charity Commission or the JNF itself speaks about different branches of JNF not being related to one another. Um, so at the time, as I said, the Charity Commission refused the, 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 the application and then uh, they, um, they said that the, what, what they care about is that the, what the, the JNF UK is doing is actually uh, ecological and environmental and it's, a, it's, a, it's an established charity in that sense, which is also problematic. So the the target for um, for our current campaign is the JNF UK because it claims to have established a park on the lands of Ajur, which is the, um, the 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 British park, and they on their website they say. Uh, and I quote: "Every penny raised by the JNF UK is sent to a project in Israel." End of quote. So that claim itself is also problematic because we know that Israel is a colonial apartheid state and in every respect the JNF follows that, uh, especially as it has already been mentioned that the, the lands controlled by the JNF are exclusively for the Jewish Jews. Not even Palestinians or so-called Arabs of Israel are allowed to, um, to that land at all. So, um, so that's one of the problems that are mentioned um, in, in the letter that I wrote um, to the Charity Commission in 2018 to ask them to, um, to provoke the charitable status of the JNF. Uh, however, also in 2018, the, J the Charity Commission wrote back saying uh, that true, that maybe the rights of my family has been um, affected by the JNF, yet uh, for the Charity Commission, they, they still uh, refused my application and that they said uh, that we, I don't have the right to ask for, for such, um, for provoking the charitable status of the JNF. Um, that in itself is a denial of the rights of my family, but also thousands of people who originally come from the village of Ajur and the neighboring villages. The, also, there is a problem with that because the forests that are managed by the many ra raised through the JNF UK is also tax de deductible. The donations uh, are also tax de deductible. And since 1990, the donations to the JNF UK have been eligible for gift aid, meaning that the British government tops up donations by adding its own 25% contribution. So that means that every British citizen, in a way, is contributing to the ethnic cleansing that is happening in these villages, including my own. Um, and also the like to say that 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 the land of Ajur in, in itself is a gift of the, uh, the of the Jewish National Fund in Great Britain is also a problem because this is land that was never sold to start with. Uh, my family still has the deeds for their lands, but also many other families. Um, my family also um, when before 1948 they paid taxes to the British authorities for land ownership. So th there is so much proof that this land was never actually uh, given up or uh, sold in, in a way. It is also a land that um, defies the, the claim of the JNF of their, their own claim that they are making the desert bloom in the historic land of Palestine, which is not true in itself because Ajur was a cultivated land. Most of the land of Palestine is a, a Mediterranean climate land. So it's, it's fer fertile land and people, uh, main source of living was ag agriculture. And to some extent still is, although we control much less land today. Um, so the park that was established on the lands of Ajur, um, when we wrote to the Charity Commission, we asked them to take into consideration the rights of my family, the, right, the rights of uh, other signatories um, of the original application, who were many other families originally from the village of Ajur. Uh, but still, um, our, our uh, request was denied. And in that d denial, there was also a denial of the war crimes that were uh, 
committed by the JNF and still are committed by ethnically cleansed Palestinian lands. So, um, so what happened later that um, the, according to the Charity Commission, uh, what they said in the reply letter, and I quote, in simple terms, the test for charitable status is a test of what an organization was set up to do, not what it does in practice. And to me, that is a bit absurd, because why do we need a charity commission if the charity commission does not actually go behind these charities to check if the, what they do is actually charitable or not? So, um, so that's why we, we decided with the help of the Stop JNF campaign and friends in, in the UK to take the Charity Commission to court. And um, the, uh, the court session uh, took place in, in April uh, 2019. And in that court session, uh, we challenged the Charity Commission First, for uh, them saying we don't have a reason, uh, reasonable cause to complain about the, the JNF UK. And of course, we, ha we do have it. We do have a legitimate reason for, um, for our request. And we have a standing in, in the sense of that we are affected by the actions of the JNF and people in, uh, from the village of Ajur are still demanding their right of return. The tribunal, however, um, again re rejected our claim, although um, even the, the opposition um, lawyer said that that our right or my right might have been affected by the, uh, the actions of the JNF. However, the, um, the, that, that denial meant that at this point only the, uh, the attorney general can, can be the one to open this case again and uh, to, um, to have a serious investigation of the JNF and its, its um, crimes against Palestinians. The point that I, I'd like to mention here is that it is British taxpayers uh, who are the ones that are now subsidizing for this, these crimes against Palestinians. So sh these crimes should not be um, hidden uh, like under what is called charitable acts and so far four generations of my family have lived in Ida refugee camp awaiting their fulfill the fulfillment of their right of return and uh, when these war crimes are portrayed as charitable act that is clearly hindering the 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 rights of Palestinians including the rights of my family so um, so far, the Stop JNF campaign has been going for about 10 years. My, my family's uh, struggle with the JNF UK has been going for about two years. But the struggle of Palestinians for the right of return has been going for more than 70 years. So if I have to struggle for 70, for 70 years for that, I'm ready to do it. I hope that justice will prevail before then, but I'm ready to fight for the rights of my family and I hope that one day we can return to Ajur together with all the millions of Palestinians who are now being uh, living in different parts of the world waiting for their right of return as well. But for our just cause to be, uh, to be realized, every little help everywhere um, is, is needed and, and the the legal route is one of them, and hopefully we can together uh, reach that one day. And I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much indeed, Halud. Well, we've heard from our three speakers now, and I'm conscious that in just five minutes, Salman must leave us in order to uh, join another important um, webinar and so I'm, I'm just going to jump in if I may and ask him um, a question. Uh, Salman, um, yes. Yeah. Um, thank you Khulud. Um, let me throw some thoughts on, on your case which is of course um, typical of seven million refugees. Um, the cases of settlers in, say, Australia, or even recently in Bosnia, um, throw some light on the case you have. Um, there is not a single settler in Palestine, on your land, who can show 
a title deed for the land he's using. Nobody does. There are a few exceptions. They are all, all of them are renting from Israel Land Administration. They are tenants, all the settlers um, in our land, refugee land, are tenants. Um, they pay rent, theoretical rent, whatever, to ILA. What is ILA? ILA is the result of a quarrel between Jewish National Fund and the State of Israel. In the early 50s, the State of Israel, settler State of Israel, said that we paid for this land by the blood of our soldiers, actually by our blood, not their blood. And then after 10 years, 1960, they settled on a plan how to exploit our land. They made an agreement that the land will be run by ILA, Israel Land Administration, jointly with a board made up of JNF and the government of Israel, how to use this land under the rules of JNF. No Palestinian, no Arab can live, can sleep, can rent this land only. Therefore, therefore, um, when a Serbian was faced with the United Nations uh, rule that they should, he should evacuate um, uh, uh, the house he's taken from a Bosnian, the United Nations said the original owner, the uh, legal ownership rests with the original owner. Nobody can claim that, no matter what. So the original owner, which was your family, always have the legal authority, no matter what happened. The question is how to do this. Uh, Israel, as I just said, had a settler sitting in your land, but he is put there by GNF. Therefore, GNF is actually um, uh, 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 exploiting illegally a stolen land. There is no question about that. And the United Nations have actually confirmed that indirectly. It asked Israel every year in November under the refugee um, revenue from refugee land forces Israel to make a record of every land is taken of Palestinians, how much revenue is taken from that, and to put it in a special record so that eventually they have to pay it back. And therefore, your claim um, against GNF in Scotland, everywhere, is quite valid. What we need to do is how to make a link between JNF worldwide and the land of your family in Ajur. As I said, if this land in Australia or in Bosnia, you can point out uh, Boris, the Serbian, he is the guy who um, took my land. And even then, this Boris, or whatever his name is in Bosnia, when he claimed he bought the land, he bought the apartment from somebody, the international law says, have you bought this land or used it, I quote, in good faith or not? In good faith means that you know it's not stolen, it's not uh, the owner uh, has been killed accordingly or what. Uh, if it is in good faith, you, the owner still have the right to get it back, but you are entitled to cost of refurbishment if you added one floor or something. If it is not in good faith, you have to be expelled and you have to pay damages, you or GNF. And, 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 and therefore, therefore, uh, uh, nobody, I mean, I don't think any Israeli settler today knows that uh, he is not sitting in a stolen land. So the idea in good faith doesn't exist. And that again emphasizes the case against GNF. We need to know the legal formulation, how an international web like GNF, which claims to be charity, I never knew that charity means theft. Uh, that's a new concept actually, that charity means theft. Um, uh, unless Karl Marx says that all wealth is stolen. That's another story. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the, how to link a crime committed 
in a place like Palestine uh, through somebody who is an agent of GNF, that's the tenant Israeli, by an organization worldwide. The quick answer to me, I'm not any you know, legal expert, is that every place where there is GNF society or group are liable because this is guilt by association. And therefore, we must continue that struggle in everywhere. You mentioned, I agree with that, 55 offices around the world. We must continue the struggle. So your struggle is a symbol of Palestinian quest for the land. Ah, uh, there, there is a small question uh, by someone that, uh, um, do I know about um, uh, E.L. Wiseman forensic architecture? I know about them, but uh, uh, we, we are not in, in contact, but it should be a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, um, uh, Salman Haloud. I'm sure that's given you and us a lot to, a lot to think about. Um, Salman, are you staying with us or do you have to a, leave? A few us? minutes until I get a call. Um, oh, okay. Well, oh, that's that's uh, that's fantastic. Um, before you go, then, Salman, can I just ask you if you would unpick the feasible part of your formula, sacred, legal, and feasible, in terms of the right of return, and explain how feasible the right of return is for everybody, just in the minute you've got left. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, sacred. That's obvious because Khalud is a young woman and she, he has never given up on her land. So 70% uh, of 7 million refugees who are young people, and probably 95% uh, of them who are born uh, after 1948. And it is legal. It's the resolution 194 is the longest standing resolution in UN history. And Actually, when people say it's a resolution, the clear answer is it's not a, just a resolution. It is an affirmation of a basic principle, Article 13 of uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is not a new invention, 194. It's just statement, restatement of that. Whether it is um, uh, uh, United Nations or not, there is a fact that Palestinians will never go away. There are th 13 million people, half of them living in Palestine today. And in year 2030, they will be 18 million. Nobody would possibly ever uh, manage to get them out. Because this will mean there is a big hole in the Middle East separating Egypt and Lebanon and uh, um, in Jordan. I mean, imagine that anywhere in, in England or somewhere, you actually dig a big hole and um, uh, uh, make Oxfordshire disappear from the world or bring somewhere people and put them there. But the question is feasible. That is what uh, is many of my good friends around the world um, say, I quote the common thing, are you going to cause um, a, a Jewish Nakba? Um, the answer, the, this question, are you going to cause Jewish Nakba, is, um, is really immoral and illegal. Uh, because someone breaks in, kills your half, half of your family, throw the other people out, and then you say, I want to get back to my house. You say, no, my, uh, the house is full of my people. Are you going to throw me out? You are going to make me a refugee? Is that, is that a good answer? This, this is never acceptable. But even so, in the last 15 years or so, we made a detailed study. Um, in brief, I'll tell you, we found that most refugee land is still empty, except in few cases there are settlement um, of kibbutz, composed of, in total, one to 2% of the population. But this is not the point. We did um, have a database knowing where the Palestinian refugees, we have a record of five or six million, where they come from, 
where is their land, um, their names, uh, in which refugee camps they are, and if they go home, how they go home, are they walking, like in Gaza, just walking, um, or are they taking a bus, maximum they will take a bus of 60 kilometers away, so they don't need ships or planes or great uh, schemes of uh, transportation. No, they just walk. Secondly, secondly, 87% of all the Israeli Jews today, they live in an area they lived in during the British mandate with a few, with a few um, extensions. I have maps showing where these few exceptions are. And then, then when, when I, I put the number of people who are living there now, against the refugees who are returning home, I find very little displacement, very little displacement. The question is, um, uh, the principle of ra uh, racism, Zionism and apartheid is the obstacle. There is no geographical problem. There is no demographical problem. There is no even economic problem. We need to build only one and a half million Housing units can be done by Palestinians in, 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 in a short time. Um, and uh, the, the Jews who live in Israel concentrate in what I call three cantons, West Jerusalem, Tel Aviv area, and Haifa area. They, we can actually create an area where they can have full uh, freedom, other than racism, of course. This would never work. And so... It's absolutely feasible. Uh, when I publish this, and I prove it from time to time, I have not, and maybe my friend uh, Ilan will concur, I have not heard from anybody a dispute about the numbers and about the maps, about education. Um, the, the, the worst thing I heard is that, oh, you are going to destroy Israel. Well, I think building Israel or destroying it is not my mission. My mission is simply like Hulud, is to, to return home. If that means a disaster for somebody else, hard luck. But if you live next door to me, you are my friend and we have coffee together. Thank you very much indeed, um, Salman. I'm just looking at the questions now and I'd like to conflate two and ask Elan to answer them, please. There's a question which is very topical about the Black Lives Matter campaign, which is now international, um, and um, whether that has an impact on the situation in Palestine. And going alongside that, a, a rather big question, but it's about how Palestine might achieve freedom. Civil powers, governments, rebellion, or an interference from outside. And I think the two questions might be put together. I don't know if you can tackle that, please. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, let's start with the, the first uh, uh, question. Of course, it's uh, an ongoing uh, event, so it's very difficult to, to, to assess, but uh, it is, it, it's part, uh, and, and I'm glad you, you fused the two questions together. I think it's, it's easier to deal with uh, the first question, which one cannot predict exactly how it would impact in the wider context. And the wider context is really what has to be done in order to push forward uh, for, uh, for a just uh, solution and the end of oppression and ethnic cleansing and colonization. Obviously, we all, we all understand that the so-called peace process, which is anyway dead, uh, has not been um, successful, to put it mildly, in fact, it just uh, provided uh, an umbrella for Israel's impunity on the ground. Uh, and uh, with it or without it, it seems that Israel was able unilaterally to do whatever it wants uh, uh, on the ground. And it's mainly Palestinian steadfastness and resistance than anything else that so far prevented it from completing uh, the ethnic cleansing it began in 1948. Uh, the movement uh, uh, forward, and that also includes the issue of uh, the impact of uh, the black, uh, um, black life uh, matters in a way, uh, is, is really, it depends on three uh, different developments. 
Uh, I mean, they can be consecutive and they can be simultaneous, uh, but all three of them are necessary for anything significant to happen on the ground. One is, uh, uh, has to do with unity on the Palestinian side. And it's not just unity for the sake of uh, a unity between uh, Fatah and Hamas. It's far more than that. It's, it's the need to hear an authentic, representative, democratic voice uh, of Palestine that tells us its vision uh, for the liberation of Palestine in this century. Uh, such a clear uh, uh, model, such a clear vision uh, will help a lot uh, the solidarity movement in the world, will even help the few, although they're not very many, but they are important, anti-Zionist Jews who are active in Israel, um, and really direct us uh, into a clearer strategy, not just against one or, or, or other Israeli violation of human rights or civil rights, but uh, against the whole Zionist project uh, and uh, its ongoing uh, uh, ethnic cleansing and dispossession of Palestine. The second uh, development is, uh, is the one that probably is connected to the question, uh, uh, the first question, and this is the, the, the way the solidarity movement with Palestine develops around the world. There was some fantastic achievement in that respect uh, with the emergence of the BDS movement, uh, the fundamental change in public opinion all over the world, especially among young people, including in the United States and including even the Jewish community in the United States, where uh, unconditional support for the Palestinian struggle is now voiced clearly and uh, without any hesitation and uh, in places where before it was very difficult to hear a clear voice such as the academia, uh, uh, and now there is uh, 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 a solidarity movement which is uh, expanding and, and, and is very solid. And, and I can't see it, I, I can't see any, re any uh, withdrawals or, or, or anything uh, uh, there going backwards, rather going forward uh, in making its voice heard. The problem in this second development is, and we are all familiar with this, is the gap between the position of the civil society and its various manifestations and the politics from above. That is the policies of governments, mainstream media, and mainstream media in particular. I think these two agents, agencies are, are, are very important for uh, changing realities on the ground. These are the politics from above and we have failed to change politics from above. And those of us who were able to be part of politics of above were uh, successfully intimidated and silenced and even uh, expelled from uh, positions uh, of power. That doesn't mean that we should not continue to do this. I'm sure we will be able to do it eventually, but we have to double or triple even our efforts in this respect. In other words, uh, uh, whatever happened uh, um, in the United States now uh, happened before for different reasons in 2008 and happened uh, and will happen probably again. The big question is, will these out justified outrages, uh, this clear uh, 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 message of people being fed up with immorality of uh, security uh, forces, uh, enforcement agencies, and governments, whether it is about the treatment of African Americans or uh, the way they handled the, the, the health crisis, whether these uh, strong voices of indignation can really create a change in policy from above. And uh, our luck in many ways is that for so many people, the issue of Palestine is symbolic for that gap between what people want the governments to do and what they're really doing. The hypocrisy in the case of Palestine is so clear that it becomes a symbol for the hypocrisy and double talk uh, and exceptionalism of other cases. And finally, and this is less important for me, but I think it will come as well if the two developments I've described uh, occurred, uh, will occur by themselves, uh, uh, by, uh, if they would occur. And this is a change from within the Israeli Jewish society, which I think can be far more significant if the two other uh, developments I was talking about would take place. Um, 
any anyone who develops hopes for at least in the near future for a military defeat of Israel or any kind of such action, I think is eluding themselves. Uh, I, I think what is really important is the fact that the moral pillar on which the Jewish state is standing has been totally eroded. It is now standing only on the material uh, 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 pillar, which is very strong because of neoliberalism and neo-capitalism. Uh, and the future of neoliberalism and neo-capitalism is directly connected to the future of a liberated Palestine. And we should create this network of identification of solidarity between anybody who's a victim, not just of Zionism, but of neoliberalism, neo-capitalism, and uh, white supremacy uh, around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Elan. Um, Hulud, uh, can I ask you if you would like to add anything? Where do you see hope lies for the future for, for Palestine? And also somebody is wanting to know what are the next steps in our campaign, our joint campaigning? Well, I think the, the hope for the future lies in, um, well, first, the, the young generations of Palestinians who believe in, in their right, uh, in their rights in general, but in the right of return in particular. And by that, I mean the, like the right of return, not only as, as, a, as a right to return to the places where people um, were originally from, but the right to choose where to live and the right to self-determination is very important here. Um, also, I think that to, for that to happen, it is not only the Palestinian side that needs education about the right of return and the importance of the future of Palestine. It is also the Israeli side. And I think to, to me personally, what, what, what I fear most is the new generations of Israelis that are brought on hatred and on, on a false narrative and how that affects them and their ability to, uh, to see justice for Palestinians. Um, so I think education is, is a very important tool, the belief in human rights in general and the right of return in particular for Palestinians. Um, in terms of the, um, like seeing the, the campaign at the minute, so we, we have reached almost a dead end with the Charity Commission. The point forward would be the intervention of the Attorney General. And if I'm not mistaken, you, you can, um, say more on this Annie but I think more than 2,000 letters from the British public have been sent to the Attorney General so far all with almost no response. Um, in Canada there has been good examples of challenging the uh, like organizations related to the JNF Canada not directly the JNF uh, through the tax um, the tax framework so like see, seeing how these uh, these organizations function and to what purposes their funding goes so that's also one one route and also raising awareness more about the JNF stopping people from donating money to it and so on is also um, important in, in the case of uh, the JNF UK. M maybe you can say more about that because you're, you're active in, in that sense as well. Thank you very, thank you very much, Halud. You've given me the perfect hook to um, just mention some things that we're asking people to do. And then I'll go to Elan and Halud for a final word before we close. Um, I recognize that there are some technical questions that people have put up in the box that we haven't yet answered, but we will try to answer those um, afterwards. But what we would very much like people to do is to visit our website where you will find uh, further information about the material that we've covered today and two actions that we would like you to become involved in. One picks up Hulud's case against the Charity Commission and when that case went forward we didn't just put just in inverted commas put Hulud's case forward, we also identified a number of other um, things that JNF UK were doing which we believe uh, should disqualify it from being a charity. And there is a letter on our website which we're asking you to 
um, sent to your MP urging the Attorney General to intervene to ensure that there is a proper investigation of the JNF, which there hasn't been so far. It's quite, it's quite scandalous. Um, actually, 4,000 letters have been sent to the Attorney General and somehow it hasn't resulted in that investigation. And the other action is another family, the Summerin family of East Jerusalem, illegally annexed East Jerusalem. And you'll find on our website details of an early day motion that's been put up and we're asking people to press their MP to sign that early day motion and critically to contact the Foreign and Commonwealth Office to put pressure to stop this eviction. The Himnuta, which is a shadowy proxy of the JNF, is front and centre of this dreadful action. And we're asking you to act. And when you do, it's not just supporting Halud and her family, and it's not just supporting the Sumerian family, but it's all Palestinians who face eviction, ethnic cleansing, and now, as we know, um, illegal annexation in the West Bank. So fighting for one is fighting for all. So we ask you to, we ask you to get involved in that. Um, Elan, I wonder, can I ask you if you'd like to say a, a final word? Okay. Yeah, uh, again, thank you for uh, allowing me to participate in this important meeting. Um, I think we said most of it, I will just reiterate that uh, because the, the, the Israeli uh, dispossession of Palestine and the Palestinian is a daily affair. And sometimes it targets individuals, sometimes it targets families, and sometimes it targets the whole population. A struggle that is also focused on one family or one individual is as important as the overall struggle for the rights of the Palestinians. The two are not mutually exclusive on the contrary. I think they are very much uh, going hand in hand, provided we will never, we never forget the general context when we deal with the private uh, uh, incident or, or, or case. Um, and uh, it is still uh, uh, staggering that uh, in 2020, uh, uh, we, if we look at uh, the, uh, internet, the public profile of the JNF in Britain, uh, the list of people who are associated with it as honorary uh, fellows or trustees it is still uh, really bewildering that we have not yet been able to expose this uh, gap between its public image and its real uh, activities in the past and in the present, uh, in, uh, in activities which violate every international law that we know and the basic uh, human and civil rights of the Palestinians. So if we can't do it through the main media and if the legal system does not allow us to go all the way in doing it, uh, we should use any other means at our disposal uh, to delegitimize uh, this, this body. Uh, and by that, I think we'll contribute uh, significantly uh, to, to justice in the struggle uh, for Palestine. And thank you very much. Thank you, Elan. Halud, can I give you the... Can I give you the final word before I sign off by thanking everyone? Um, again, thank you very much for involving me in this um, very interesting meeting and thank you everybody who attended. I wanted to finish with uh, reminding everyone that the JNF is actually a racist organization, an organization that was uh, established to eth ethnically cleanse Palestine and that for all these so-called parks that uh, where the JNF is uh, functioning today, all these places were originally uh, owned and still are uh, owned by Palestinians who have became refugees in 1948 or the years after. Uh, the work of the JNF to to continue the ethnic cleansing is still going ongoing and examples from different parts of historic Palestine still are manifested today so that's also something to remember um, but it's also to, good to remember that the land of Ajur is still there it is still empty 
um, and that those who have left in 1948 have never given up their right of return and they will hopefully return one day with the help and support of people of consciousness everywhere, including those in the UK. So, um, and we will continue this struggle until we hold the Charity Commission and the JNF UK accountable. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Lloyd. Now, everything we've heard about today, all the dreadful things that we heard that the JNF are doing, the criminal activities, took place at a time when it was a registered charity. It's been a registered charity since 1939. So um, please join us. Please go on our website and support the actions. And um, come back next month when uh, Jonathan Cook, uh, the distinguished journalist and author, um, will be speaking to us and taking the narrative a stage further. And we'll also have a film link with um, Al Araqib, the, the JNF is very busy in the NACAB saying that it's a politically uncomplicated area in which to work. Well, the people of Al Araqib uh, would strongly dispute that. So please join us next month. And I'll finish by saying a huge um, thanks to uh, Salman, to Elan, and to Halud for a fantastic. Um, presentation. Thank you very much. I've learned a great deal from it and enjoyed meeting you very much. Um, take care and goodbye to everybody in friendship and solidarity with Palestine. Mm -hmm.